All right. So it's 9.30, maybe we can begin. So namaste and suswagatam uh, and a warm welcome to this course on computational topology theory and applications. So the plan for today is the following. Uh, today's lecture will have three broad parts. The first part will concern the administrative matters uh, relating to this course. The second part will basically uh, concern the first half of the course, the topics that we'll be covering and so on and so forth. And the second or the third part will concern uh, the topics that uh, Professor Vijay Natarajan would be covering in the second half of the course. So let us begin with uh, some administrative matters. OK, so fortunately, uh, because the COVID cases have been rising one more time, OK, uh, I think the Institute has decided to, uh, uh, you know, have this uh, at least the first half of the semester online. OK, so I thought I'll put pictures of uh, the uh, instructors who will be taking this course. So to your left is uh, Professor Vijay Natarajan, um, who will be teaching the second half of the course. And uh, to your right is uh, uh, a picture of myself. So my name is Guhan Thope. So I uh, request that you uh, call me either uh, Guhan or, uh, you know, if you want, uh, you can call me Dr. Thope. I pre personally do not prefer you calling me sir and so on and so forth. Uh, OK, so I, you can use either of the two, uh, uh, you know, uh, I mean, you can either call me Guggen or Dr. Thope. All right. OK, so uh, for this course, uh, we are thankful to Tane and Aditya. So they have agreed to be teaching assistants, so they will help us with the grading and, uh, you know, uh, uh, they will also be uh, fine with answering some of the questions that you may have throughout this course. And uh, Tane was uh, actually one of the students in uh, uh, the course last year. And uh, he has written some uh, lecture notes for the entire course. And, uh, you know, I'm happy to upload those notes. I went over those notes and I found them to be very good. So I will upload them. And uh, in case you want, you can go over the lecture notes yourself uh, whenever you wish. All right. <clears throat> uh, so a couple of, uh, 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 you know, points with uh, regards to, uh, you know, uh, how you can ask questions and so on and so forth. OK, so the protocol that we will be following is as follows. Uh, whenever you have questions at any time during today's class, I request you to, uh, you know, stop me. And the way I want you to stop me is that uh, I hope you are aware that uh, as part of Teams, uh, there is an option to raise hands. Is that okay? So please raise your hands. And uh, whenever I see raised hands, I'll stop myself. I'll ask you to unmute and uh, you can then go ahead and ask your questions. Is that okay? So uh, uh, I hope that is clear. So first, let me go over the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the details of the course. OK, so uh, this course is typically is offered either in the spring, Vasant or the semester that spans from January to April. OK, so uh, I mean, uh, perhaps some of you may be aware that uh, this course was only started last year before this. Uh, you know, computational topology and computational geometry was offered jointly. But from the last year, computational topology and computational geometry are uh, being offered as two different courses. So I hope you are aware that uh, uh, there is a parallel course by the name of computational geometry, which is being uh, jointly offered by uh, Professor Rahul and Professor uh, Satish. Is that OK? So uh, this uh, is something that you may want to be aware of. All right. So this is a Pule course. This is a level 200 course and the credits uh, that are assigned to this course are four. Uh, that is three is to one. And the prerequisites for this course are the following. So we uh, uh, expect that uh, you should have credited uh, design and analysis of algorithms. That is this E0225 and uh, you should be uh, familiar with uh, both linear algebra and probability at least at the level of E0226, right? So it's fine if you have taken uh, uh, these courses. Uh, you know, in your undergraduate uh, study as well. So that is also fine. So in case you haven't taken these courses, um, uh, you know, we request that you write to us, uh, you know, we will uh, sort of look at your details. Maybe you can share your CV or some of the courses that you may have uh, relevant courses, like courses that are similar to these courses that you may have done before. And you can write to us and, uh, you know, we will uh, sort of uh, deal with it on a case by case basis and let you know if uh, you can go ahead and register for the course. OK, those who have taken these courses, OK, you are uh, uh, more than welcome to register for this course directly. Uh, you don't have to take any permission. All right. 
Okay, so uh, uh, the hub of activity will be uh, this uh, Microsoft team. Okay, and uh, uh, there is a team by the name of uh, E0207 Computational Topology Theory and Applications. Right, so you can directly search for this team. Uh, so there is uh, a team for the previous year as well, which had the same name. So make sure that you are not looking at the old team, but you are looking at the new team and you can directly try to join the new team by using this password. OK, so you don't have to wait for any permission from our end. You can directly put in the password and you should be uh, able to log into this team over here. All right, and all the lecture materials uh, uh, you know, recordings of videos and uh, assignments and all those things. OK, will uh, 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 you know that uh, Microsoft team will sort of act as the place where all these things will be available for you. So it is important that you become part of this team. All right, uh, so I'm sure you know this, but nevertheless, uh, uh, let me sort of uh, uh, go over the uh, details with regards to the schedule of the course. OK, so as you may be aware, uh, uh, this course, this uh, uh, course will be, I mean, the classes for this course will be held on two days. That is Tuesdays and Thursdays from 9.30 a.m. to 11 a.m. Uh, <clears throat> right after the class, uh, we plan to host office hours. So from 11 to 11.30 a.m., right after the class, we will have office hours. So uh, I realize that many of you are not familiar with this concept of office hours, right? So office hours, uh, uh, you know, formally is the time that is dedicated for doubt solving okay so it can either be related to administrative matters it can either be related to you know uh, uh, academic matters maybe you have some questions on your project and so on and so forth okay so this is the time that uh, you should uh, uh, you know um, uh, try to ask these questions during OK, uh, so often many people, you know, sort of write to us after these office hours, you know, write emails and write, uh, 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 you know, post in Microsoft Teams and so on and so forth. So unfortunately, uh, you know, uh, all of us, including the TAs and the instructors, right, uh, we are busy with several things. So it's a bit difficult to uh, uh, answer these questions quickly if you ask them outside these office hours. OK, during these office hours, we will be uh, directly available. You can post your questions uh, either on Teams or you can, you know, verbally ask them and, uh, you know, you will get immediate responses. OK, so please make full utilization of these office hours. OK, and don't wait uh, right before the exam if you have questions and, you know, suddenly send in uh, a bunch of emails and expect us to reply immediately. Uh, uh, so unfortunately, that will be difficult from our end. So I uh, uh, sincerely request all of you to make use of this time. You can ask as many questions as possible during this time. All right. So the dates for uh, the course is as follows. So the first class is on 4th of January, which is today, and the classes will run, uh, uh, you know, all the way until 12th of April. So if I'm not not wrong if and if my calculations are correct uh, there will overall be 29 lectures is that okay and uh, the uh, so here are some dates with regards to the midterm the first midterm will be held on 22nd of february and uh, right after that which is 24th of february is when professor vijay natarajan will start uh, teaching his part of the course and uh, hopefully professor vijay natarajan either in his first class or before that he will tell you you know when midterm 2 would be scheduled okay OK, so some details with regards to the evaluation criteria. So uh, uh, you will be evaluated in the following three ways. OK, so the first is assignment. So you will have four assignments overall. So two in my part of the course and two in the part of the course that Professor Vijay Natarajan would be teaching. And the overall weightage for these assignments would be 20 percent. Thereafter, you will have two midterms. So one midterm uh, concerning my part of the course and another midterm concerning uh, what Professor Vijay Natarajan will be teaching. So uh, overall, this is uh, 40 percent. So 20 percent for each of the midterms. And finally, there is uh, 40 percent weightage for the project. OK, so you can see that overall this is 100 percent. And the thing to keep in mind is that uh, there will be no separate final exam. OK, so there will be no final exam. Uh, uh, your overall grade will be based on these three factors. All right, uh, so project, as you can see, forms a very important part uh, of your evaluation and uh, you may want to uh, keep in mind these uh, uh, dates in mind. OK, so uh, 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 one thing uh, you don't have to note down anything because these uh, slides will be made available uh, via Teams. The only thing that you have to uh, basically write down is this password. OK, so maybe I'll, uh, you know, uh, keep this slide on for a couple of uh, seconds and I request sincerely that everyone, uh, you know, uh, notes down this password 
OK, and uh, so that you will be able to, uh, 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 you know, become a member of this team. And once you become member of this team, uh, you know, all the resources will be made available to you and, uh, you know, uh, in but including this uh, slides that we will be discussing today. OK, so you don't have to, uh, uh, you know, copy anything down. All right. OK, so as you saw, the project forms a very important part of the course and uh, here are some important dates. Again, you don't need to uh, write them down. Uh, these slides will be made available to you via team, but nevertheless, uh, here is what is expected from you. So roughly, uh, 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 you know, by the end of this month or uh, maybe by the end of the first week, Professor Vijay Natarajan and I would make you uh, 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 make available a bunch of uh, papers and by February 15th, OK, all these papers will be uh, uh, papers and topics for the projects would be made available in some folder on teams. OK, and uh, around March 1st, that is roughly two months from now, you would be expected to identify groups and topics and send us a project proposal. OK, so what the format of the proposal should be and so on and so forth. Those details will be made available to you closer to this date, but uh, uh, roughly around this time. We expect that uh, you should have formed a group uh, now it, uh, like uh, the size of the group will usually depend on how many students end up registering for the course, but uh, the recommended number is uh, two or at the most three. OK, so this is what we recommend. Uh, 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 OK, so by March 1st, uh, these three things should be, uh, you know, uh, ready from your end. OK, so uh, on March 18th, we would have a paper presentation. So uh, for the topic that you may have chosen, uh, there may be a, uh, either one or a couple of papers that may be uploaded in the folder. So whatever you have chosen, uh, that paper you should be presenting on March 19th. OK, and the final project presentation will be held on April 29th. OK, so this will mainly concern uh, the, uh, you know, uh, 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 the details that are present in the paper. OK, so uh, broadly speaking, whatever is the paper, you read that paper, understand that paper and uh, present to us your understanding of that paper. However, uh, in this final presentation, uh, we expect you to present your work. OK, so you sort of read that project and maybe extend some ideas in that project and uh, you know, uh, 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 so accordingly, whatever you do, OK, you have to present that part and that's what uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, I mean, this project pre presentation basically concerns that part. And uh, uh, so as I mentioned in the previous slide, the overall project has 40% weightage. Uh, so 10% weightage is given to paper presentation and 30% weightage is given to your project presentation. Is that OK? All right, so uh, the next slide concerns academic misconduct. OK, so time and again we have noticed that several students sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, for some reason or the other indulge in malpractices. They try to copy, they try to, you know, uh, 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 you know, directly copy uh, uh, answers that are present online or, you know, uh, uh, directly copy from students or their friends and so on and so forth and submit the same. Is this OK? So, uh, uh, you know, for students who have who may have been part of this linear algebra and probability course, I hope you uh, are aware that uh, several students were caught, uh, uh, you know, indulging in these malpractices and they were penalized. Right. Uh, so I do. I hope that, uh, you know, uh, you know, those things are not repeated during this course. So, uh, uh, you know, let me sort of talk about this academic misconduct in two possible ways. First is in a principled perspective, right? So many people think that, you know, when they indulge in this academic malpractice and so on, they are fooling the instructor. OK, but uh, uh, here is a quote on that. OK, the first principle in science is that you must not fool yourself and you are the easiest person to fool. OK, so whenever you indulge in malpractice, it's not we who you are feeling, but rather it's uh, uh, yourself that you are fooling. Is that OK? So, uh, uh, you know, when you sort of graduate out of ISC, we expect you to be world class scientists, world class researchers who can, you know, uh, uh, solve hard problems, who can collaborate with, uh, you know, world class researchers from all around the world. OK, but uh, uh, in order to be able to reach that position, uh, it requires you to be well trained. OK, and this, uh, uh, you know, your training would be good only if you uh, sincerely and honestly, you know, apply the concepts that you study, understand what is happening. Whenever you don't understand, you put in more effort to figure out why are you not understanding. If you get poor scores in exams, 
okay you sort of figure out okay why did i get poor scores come up with a strategy to you know uh, uh, see uh, what led to your failure you know attempt to improve your strategy so that you can improve upon it so these things will help you in the long run okay so copying and scoring uh, while you may get some immediate short term goals right unless you uh, uh, get caught of course if you caught get caught then you will be penalized but uh, if you don't get caught also okay the immediate gain would be that you would get some scores but uh, uh, overall your learning would be very minimal okay so uh, this is what is expected okay so you may have come from different uh, places in india where uh, you know copying and cheating may all be common but uh, you know as you sort of move up in your life you will realize that uh, only people who are uh, who are whose understanding of concepts is really uh, uh, well grounded okay those are the people who are able to you know make significant contributions to the society okay so this is something uh, i wanted to say but nevertheless i'm sure some of you will still ignore the uh, uh, request that i made on the previous slide and indulge in academic misconduct okay so for those students i would like to uh, uh, you know uh, inform that uh, the isc administration has empowered the faculty members to penalize students uh, uh, indulging in malpractices okay so the simplest of these uh, punishments is that uh, if we find that you have indulged in some malpractice with regards to an assignment a midterm or an ex uh, uh, project okay we can directly give you zero marks okay so that is uh, the first of the penalty options that is available with us the second is a one grade penalty right so if we find that you are repeatedly indulging in these malpractices uh, then uh, uh, let's say the overall grade that you obtain is b plus then uh, you know we can sort of directly chop off uh, uh, one alphabet like maybe you go from b plus to c right and uh, if you sort of indulge in some serious practice malpractice then we can also uh, 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 you know fail uh, fail you and uh, the last uh, the last two options are quite serious okay so there is a, 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 an agency called as ocap which helps students get placements internships and so on and so forth okay so uh, the faculty members are empowered to report to this agency as well about you and uh, in which case your placements and uh, internships and all those things will get affected and of course if uh, 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 the uh, uh, you know uh, malpractice that is involved in is quite serious then uh, you know the faculty members can also recommend for termination of studentship all right so uh, now let me uh, you know go over the course outline okay so as i said uh, the course uh, will broadly be taught in two parts the first part will be taught by b that is uh, gugan okay and uh, i will roughly have uh, uh, 13 lectures okay so if you count the total number of lectures here there will roughly be 13 of them okay and in the first uh, three lectures we will go over this uh, preliminaries okay so this is uh, just to sort of refresh for you these uh, different concepts from group theory and linear algebra okay so some of the topics that we may go over is group homomorphism quotient group and so on and so forth okay and uh, the bulk of this uh, 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 the first part will be devoted to what is called as simplicial homology okay so uh, 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 you know uh, right after this uh, uh, discussion on administrative matters uh, i will sort of give an overview of the topics we will be covering in the first half in that i will uh, uh, go over some of these concepts and you know you will get an overview of uh, the different things that we will be learning as part of this course okay so the bulk of this course uh, will be uh, devoted to uh, simplicial homology okay and uh, uh, based on how much time permits we will also uh, 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 devote some lectures to random topology in this part we will basically look at some recent literature that uh, concerns this topic of random topology okay so as i mentioned uh, the course will be taught in two parts the first part is by uh, uh, myself and the second part will be taught by professor vijay natrajan so he will go over the following four broad topics which which is uh, 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 persistent homology uh, morse functions uh, morse mail complex and contour tree reeb graphs okay so again uh, 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 at the end of uh, like the third part of today's class uh, professor vijay natrajan will give an overview of some of the topics that he will be covering okay uh, so now let me talk about some textbooks and references that we will be using okay so to be honest uh, there is uh, 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 no textbook okay which uh, is uh, which sort of covers the material the way we want it 
okay however uh, you know uh, at different points in time we will be referring uh, material uh, like different parts different portions from these two textbooks okay so first textbook is called uh, uh, computational topology and introduction by uh, uh, herbert adels bruner and john herrer by the way uh, 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 adels bruner was uh, the phd advisor for professor vijay natrajan okay and uh, uh, the second textbook that we will be following is this textbook called algebraic topology by allen hatcher okay uh, so as i said uh, you know we will only be using these textbooks for uh, you know um, once in a while okay but uh, for all our classes uh, either we will be providing lecture notes or slides or uh, uh, of course uh, uh, the recordings of the lectures will also be made available to you okay so hopefully the material that we provide to you will be self contained and in case uh, you know you need to uh, understand some uh, things in much more detail okay then you can definitely you are definitely encouraged to go and look at these textbooks okay and throughout this course we will try and see that you know whatever we are talking about uh, we will also try to uh, connect it to some of the current literature okay so by that mean we will try and connect it to some of the recent uh, papers is this okay so with this we finish the discussion on the administrative uh, uh, matters okay so if you have any questions i encourage you to raise hands and i'll ask you to unmute and then you can go ahead and ask questions okay so i uh, request that you keep the questions uh, you know with uh, in relation to these administrative matters okay questions regarding the topics and so on it may be best that you ask after we go over the overview okay so in that sense you will have an understanding of the topics that we'll be covering and then it may make more sense to ask questions re relating to that however if you have any questions with regards to the administrative part uh, please go ahead and raise your hands and ask them i'll wait for a, a couple of minutes okay do you have any questions uh, professor vijay natrajan if i have missed anything uh, please go ahead and add them Uh, no, that's fine. Yeah, and and I also prefer Vijay. So yeah, yeah, for okay. everyone. <laughs> Thank sure. you. Yeah, so I'm waiting for a a, a couple of seconds. Uh, if you have any questions in relation to administrative matters, uh, this may be a good time to ask. all right so i don't uh, see any raised hands so hopefully there are no questions uh, i hope everyone has noted down the password uh, for joining the microsoft team okay if you haven't noted that password please raise your hand okay so professor vijay natrajan has actually uh, uh, posted the password as part of the comment so maybe you can uh, look it up from there as well all right okay so now we shift gears and uh, now we will sort of so now we have now done with the first part of today's class we now move on to the second part uh, as i mentioned at the beginning there are three broad parts to this uh, class today okay so the second part uh, will basically give an overview of the topics that i will be covering and the third part will uh, give an overview of the topics that professor vijay natrajan will be covering all right okay so the fundamental question in computational topology is the following right so let's say you are given a bunch of points right so let's say uh, 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 something like this right so and the question that one would like to ask is what is the shape of these bunch of points right so uh, uh, let's try to understand where one may get hold of these bunch of points so uh, you can imagine that each point over here is some vector right so maybe this is a vector in some n dimensional space okay so n dimensional space uh, so n could be let's say very large maybe 100 or you know a uh, million or something like that and each coordinate of uh, this vector may be uh, uh, say something right so maybe uh, 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 each point over here okay corresponds to a uh, 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 medical uh, 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 you know history of a patient okay <laughs> or maybe i'll say uh, 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 statistics 
okay some medistic medical statistics related to a patient right like maybe the first coordinate corresponds to weight of the patient the second coordinate maybe corresponds to the height of the patient and let's say the third coordinate corresponds to the glucose level uh, that uh, he had in the last reading and uh, uh, and so on and so forth right so you have a vector each vector corresponds to one person and in this way you have a bunch of vectors corresponding to uh, 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 you know several patients Right, and the once I mean in data analysis, you will often come across uh, such data. And the question that you may one of the questions that you would like to ask is, what is the shape of this data? Right. So uh, 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 in topology, in some sense, this is the fundamental question to ask. What is shape? Okay, and if you are given a space and an or, or an object or a bunch of data points, what can you say about its shape? Okay, so that is the fundamental question. Right. So if someone asked you what is topology? Well, uh, uh, a very short answer is that topology concerns uh, itself with the study of shapes. Right. So, uh, of course, you must have seen shapes before as well. In particular, in geometry, you must have seen shapes, uh, 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 you know, there as well. However, unlike geometry, OK, uh, the key thing or the key difference uh, between geometry and topology is that topology ignores exact measurements. Right. So when you talk about geometry, you will recall that uh, the focus is mainly on, uh, you know, distances, OK, uh, angles, maybe uh, areas, maybe perimeters and so on and so forth. Right. So this is the focus uh, in geometry. Right. In topology, we kind of ignore all these things. Right. So we try to ignore all these things. So uh, maybe I'll give an example of uh, 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 what do I mean by that? Right. So let's say I asked you a question whether this triangle and this triangle are one and the same or not. Right. So if you ask a student who sort of viewed this from a geometric perspective, he will say that, of course, this triangle and this triangle are not the same. Right. So in particular, he will say that, look, uh, uh, the uh, triangle on the left is a right angle triangle, whereas the triangle on the light is an equilateral triangle. So notice that when we say something is a right angle triangle, when we say something is an equilateral triangle, OK, we are uh, either referring to the angles or, you know, uh, some other measurement. Right. So he will say that because, uh, uh, you know, we are looking at the angles and since one of the angles over here is 90 degrees and all the angles over here are 60 degrees. OK, these two triangles are not one and the same. Similarly, if you look at this uh, second set of images, right, or second set of objects, and if someone asked you whether these two objects are one and the same, again, if you were a student of geometry, you would say that no, they are not one and the same because the object on the left is a circle, whereas the object on the right is an ellipse, and clearly a circle and uh, 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 an ellipse, okay, these are not one and the same, right? However, if you ask a topologist, OK, whether the bunch of objects that we saw on the previous slide are one and the same, he will say that indeed they are the same, right? So this, 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 these five different uh, shapes, OK, they are all one and the same, right? So in some sense, a topologist ignores measurements, but rather looks at the shape, right? So one can ask, OK, why are the shapes of these, uh, uh, you know, five objects over here one and the same, right? So the way to answer this uh, would be the following. Right. So you can, uh, you know, uh, imagine that you had a rubber band, right? And using this rubber band, okay, so uh, recall that since you have a rubber band, you can stretch this rubber band, okay, you can pull this rubber band, you can, you know, shrink this rubber band the way you want it, and you can twist and turn and all those things you can do, right? So imagine you had this blue rubber band, and if I asked you to form, uh, you know, a, a shape which looked like that of a right angle triangle, then you would be able to easily do it, right? And maybe if you pull this uh, a triangle a little bit, I mean, this uh, rubber band in a different fashion, maybe you'll be able to construct this equilateral triangle itself, right? So you can see that although you just had this uh, rubber band over here by sort of pulling and uh, pushing here and there, you can form these different shapes. In fact, you could also be able to form this uh, uh, swig swiggly, swiggly looking shape, right? And uh, perhaps you can also form this circle or if I asked you to form a square, you will also be able to form this square, right? So just by pushing and pulling, you can see that you can form all these things. And whenever you, uh, 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 you know, are able to do these transformations, we will say that all these objects, okay, the resultant objects have the same shape. Is this okay? So roughly that's what, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, topology is all about. So it's important that when a, a question is asked, right, whether two objects are same or not or similar or not, it depends on 
from which perspective you are looking at that question or from which perspective are you trying to answer that question right so here is an alternative example let's say if i ask you is 2 equals 4 right so if i ask you this question what would your answer be now if you ask this question to a, 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 a school going uh, a person right or a school going child right he will say of course they are different Right. However, if you ask a mathematician, OK, if two equals four, the first question he, he would ask you is from what perspective are you asking this question? OK, so he may ask, are you uh, sort of viewing these numbers as decimal numbers? Right. So, of course, if you are viewing them as decimal numbers, then the answer is no. However, if you sort of view them as uh, from the perspective of mod to arithmetic, Right. Uh, 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 in which case you sort of take two numbers divided by two and uh, look at the remainder. Right. If the remainders uh, turn out to be the same, then you will say that those two numbers are one and the same. And uh, uh, if uh, on the other hand, the remainders turn out to be different, then, uh, 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 you know, you can conclude that indeed these two numbers are different. Right. So from the mod to arithmetic perspective, indeed, you can conclude that these two numbers are one and the same. Right. So in a similar fashion, when two objects are given to you and you are asked whether two objects are same or not. Right. It depends on which perspective you take. OK, the answer will depend on which perspective you take. If you take a geometric perspective, then, uh, you know, the distances, different measurements, all those things will have to be taken into account to answer this question. OK, on the other hand, uh, uh, when you sort of take a, 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 a perspective based on topology, OK, then uh, most of these things will not matter. And we will see in uh, uh, the this course, OK, from a topologist perspective, when would we say that two objects are similar and when would we say that two objects are dissimilar? OK, so in some sense, that's the question that, uh, you know, throughout this course, we will try and answer. Right. So uh, uh, if you sort of take any textbook on topology, uh, you will sort of realize that the fundamental goal of topology in some sense is to make a catalog of all possible shapes. OK, so in some sense, this is the fundamental goal. OK, uh, come up with a catalog or a dictionary of all possible shapes. Right. So, uh, 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 you know, so, uh, you know, a similar task would be to, you know, make a catalog of all possible English alphabets. Right. So if someone asked you to form a catalog of all possible English alphabets, you will say that indeed there are 26 alphabets A to Z and this is the catalog of all possible alphabets. Right. So if someone comes up with an alphabet, you will sort of to in order to decode what that alphabet is, you will take that alphabet, look at your catalog and figure out, OK, this is that alphabet. OK, so in the same way, the uh, uh, purpose of making this catalog of all possible shapes is tomorrow if you see a shape, right, you would like to sort of give it a name. So what you do is you take the shape, you go over this catalog that you have made of all possible shapes and then you compare it and then you say, OK, this is the, the new shape, uh, the shape that has been given to me is so and so shape. OK, so that's the reason why, uh, you know, often we would like to make a catalog or a dictionary of different objects. And in topology, the goal is to make a catalog of all possible shapes. Right. However, when, uh, uh, you know, mathematicians uh, 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 try to answer this question, they realize that there are too many shapes. Right. So there are too many shapes and uh, uh, then uh, uh, several important mathematicians like Enrico Betty and so on and so forth. OK, they felt that, uh, 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 you know, it may be, uh, uh, you know, useful to basically not distinguish between all possible shapes. OK, and basically say that some shapes are similar. OK, so in that way we will be able to reduce the number of all possible shapes. Is this OK? So uh, 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 so when do we say shapes are similar? OK, so this uh, uh, broadly can be done in these following three different ways. The first is uh, uh, at the level of homeomorphism. The uh, second is at the level of homotomy equivalence. And the third is at the level of isomorphism of homology groups. OK, and in this course, we will mainly focus on uh, uh, this uh, idea of uh, uh, looking at things, uh, uh, you know, from the perspective of homology groups. OK, so uh, uh, the first half of this course that I'll be covering will more or less be devoted towards understanding what homology is and how do we compute the homology. So when I say compute, OK, uh, uh, one would be able to write algorithms to compute this homology and so on and so forth. Right. So uh, then one can ask, OK, uh, why don't we uh, uh, study these two things in detail? Well, the answer to that is that unfortunately, 
okay computing uh, uh, you know uh, like answering questions uh, like whether two groups are homeomorphic or not okay uh, 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 answering this question from a computational perspective is very hard similarly to check if two spaces are homotopy equivalent or not okay this again uh, uh, is not computational uh, uh, friendly okay on the other hand uh, as you will see in this course okay computing homology groups and so on and so forth one can actually write algorithms right and in that sense it is uh, uh, computation friendly and this is the reason uh, 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 you know uh, the focus of uh, this course will be on uh, the homology part okay nevertheless uh, uh, you know in this uh, first uh, part of the course uh, in the first class we will actually uh, uh, you know understand at a loose level what homeomorphism means what homotopy equivalence means what homology means okay and we will try and see how uh, do these three concepts compare with each other okay so at this point uh, you may want to keep in mind that uh, there is some notion, uh, level of gradation uh, 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 or some notion of uh, weakness in the definitions of these three concepts right and uh, 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 that goes as follows right so let's say i have two objects x and y and if i say that x and y are homeomorphic to each other right so let's say i say this and this are homeomorphic right uh, homeomorphic okay so then from this fact you would be able to immediately conclude that x and y are also homotopy equivalent right so you would be able to conclude this and uh, uh, from this fact you would be able to conclude that x and y and if you look at their homology groups okay the homology groups of x and y okay are uh, isomorphic okay so you would be able to conclude these three things so what do i mean by this is that uh, homeomorphism implies homotopy equivalence which in turn implies that the homology groups are equivalent okay so uh, uh, this is the direction of implication however uh, uh, this is not true that if two spaces are homotopy equivalent it is not necessarily true that they were also homeomorphic we will see an example of this in the next slide right and uh, 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 it is also not true that if two spaces are uh, you know uh, uh, you know their homology groups are isomorphic then it is not true that uh, they are also homotopy equivalent is that okay and in turn uh, 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 you know uh, uh, it is also also not necessarily true that they are homeomorphic right however it is uh, uh, you know because of this way of implication it is automatically true that if two spaces uh, uh, you know are not homotopy equivalent then they necessarily are not homeomorphic similarly if there are two spaces whose homology groups are not isomorphic then it is automatically follows that they are not homotopy equivalent as well right so uh, 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 you know the negative direction sort of negative implication direction is in the following that if two uh, uh, spaces if their homology groups are not isomorphic then it automatically implies that uh, 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 they are not homotopy equivalent and that in turn implies that they are not homeomorphic is this okay all right so uh, uh, you know as i said we we'll, let's uh, briefly go over these three ideas of homeomorphism homotopy equivalence and uh, this uh, uh, isomorphism at the level of homology groups right so what is homeomorphism so here is the formal definition of when we would say two spaces are homeomorphic to each other okay so let me just read this out aloud okay two objects x and y are said to be homeomorphic if there exists okay so for uh, those who have not seen this symbol before uh, this is there exists okay uh, so two spaces or objects x and y are homeomorphic if there exists a continuous bijection f between x and y such that its inverse is also continuous okay so there are three things you need to uh, 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 look out for over here okay so it says that two spaces are said to be homeomorphic if there exists a continuous function this function should also be a bijection right so this automatically implies that uh, there exists an inverse of this function however we also require that this inverse also be continuous okay so for those who have done uh, uh, a bit of functional analysis they will be able to immediately able to see that uh, a continuous bijection does not imply that the inverse is also continuous okay so this is not implied so we require that this property also be satisfied separately okay so this function needs to satisfy these three properties that uh, this should be continuous it should be a bijection and its inverse should also 
also be continuous right so if you can find such a function between x and y then you will say that x and y are homeomorphic okay so here is an example let's say you have this alphabet c and let's say you have this alphabet i or l whichever you want to think of so let's think of this as uh, you know the alphabet i right so now one can ask uh, uh, you know are these two things homeomorphic to each other okay so my claim is that yes they are homomorphic and uh, in order to justify why they are homomorphic i'll try and construct such an f right so here is an f so f means uh, so function means uh, you know uh, the function has to take something as input and give something as output okay so the the function f over here will take a point from the figure on the left as input and spit out a point uh, from the figure on the right okay like for example this function over here uh, takes in as input uh, this corner point over here and spits out this corner point similarly when you give this second corner point as input this is mapped to this corner point and every uh, uh, point in between okay is uh, uh, accordingly mapped to some point over here is this okay so f sort of maps maybe some point over here some point like this to over here and so on right so every point on this alphabet c is mapped to every point on this alphabet i so if you construct such a function okay uh, 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 you will be able to see that this function over here indeed is continuous is a bijection and one can show that its inverse is also continuous okay so because of the existence of this function it follows that this alphabet c and i are homeomorphic to each other is this okay now uh, 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 you know a more uh, uh, non trivial example of this uh, is the following okay so if you take any uh, 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 you know uh, textbook on topology or if you sort of try and hear any course on topology okay or if you also try to look at some jokes on topology you will uh, always find this a uh, figure uh, uh, you know as part of the discussion so let me also present that okay <clears throat> so the claim over here is that uh, the object that is over here okay so this is a solid donut okay or a solid meduvada okay a solid donut or uh, meduvada right so think of this right and uh, uh, the object over here is a cup right so the claim is that uh, you know this object over here which is a solid donut or a solid meduvada okay this is actually homeomorphic to this cup right so uh, again if someone asks you why do you say it is homeomorphic one would be able to uh, you know explicitly construct a function okay which maps points uh, on the solid donut to this cup over here and in turn uh, uh, ensure that uh, you know all the three properties that were specified on the previous slide are satisfied and uh, consequently conclude that indeed the cup over here and the solid donut over here okay they are homeomorphic to each other okay so uh, uh, now one can ask okay i sort of loosely understand this idea of homeomorphism i sort of also know a bunch of examples when two objects are or spaces are homeomorphic to each other can you give me an example of two spaces that are not homeomorphic to each other okay so here is such an example okay so you you ignore these axes only focus on this circle that is over here right so the difference between this circle that you have on the left and the circle that you have on the right is that one point over here has been removed okay so one point removed okay so this is the difference between the figure on the left and the figure on the right right so one can ask is the figure on the left and the figure on the right homeomorphic to each other or not right so uh, in order to show that it is homeomorphic you would uh, you know uh, uh, you should be able to somehow try to construct a map f okay such that uh, those three properties are satisfied okay so uh, in this case uh, uh, you know uh, 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 you know if you sort of look at some textbook on uh, uh, you know uh, topology you will realize that you know uh, you know these two objects are actually not homeomorphic to each other and consequently you would not be able to find such a function f right and here is a quick way to see that uh, why such a function f will not exist between two these two figures and why these two figures are not homeomorphic to each other okay so homeomorphism at a loose level means that these two objects are basically one and the same right in particular if we do a, 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 a set of operations on the figure 
okay and whatever is the output of those set of operations and if you do the same set of operations on the second figure the output should be the same okay so that's roughly what homeomorphism means okay so here is an operation where the output will be different okay so let's say you have this figure and let's say you decide to remove one of these points right so if you remove one of these points okay what would you end up with you would end up with something that looks like this and if i ask you how many connected components are there in the resultant figure your answer would be one is this okay on the other hand if you come on this side and if you try to remove uh, 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 one of the points from this figure so notice that i'm doing the exact same operation so you pick any point from this figure let's say you pick this point of course you have to only pick one point okay and now if you remove that point and if you ask how many components are there in the resultant figure you will be able to immediately see that in the resultant figure there are two components right so uh, 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 we did the same operation on this figure as well as this figure and observe that uh, the resultant uh, the result that we obtained are have different properties okay so uh, uh, from this uh, uh, observation one can conclude that indeed these two objects or these two figures that we have over here are not homeomorphic to each other okay so i hope uh, now you have <coughs> at least one example or uh, a couple of examples of spaces that are homeomorphic to each other and uh, i hope you also uh, uh, have an example of two spaces that are not homeomorphic to each other so let me pause here for a second or two if you have any questions with regards to what we have discussed so far uh, please uh, go ahead and ask your question this is a good time Uh, do you have any questions? Yes, Jen, please unmute yourself. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, sir. Uh, I'm having two questions. Uh, so one is regarding uh, uh, the pro project, sir. Uh, so mm -hmm. how, what kind of projects are we supposed to accomplish at the end? And what, what, what will be its nature like? I mean, the, yeah, so the short answer is that, uh, uh, you know, we will be giving you some research papers. You would be expected to read these papers. Uh, there will be some, uh, you know, uh, like uh, one flavor of papers could be like something that is more uh, uh, experimental in nature, where there are some bunch of experiments that have been conducted uh, in that paper. We expect you to understand that. And maybe we ask you to implement that in a different scenario. Right. And you do it in a different scenario, which is maybe a generalization of the scenario that has been considered in the paper. So you do that experiment and, uh, you know, you sort of uh, 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 try and understand the outcome of that experiment and report your findings. So maybe the project could be of that nature. Is okay. that OK? Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, and se second is like uh, about the grading policy, sir. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so it will be re re relative or absolute? Sir? It will be relative to the performance of other students. OK. Yeah. Thank you, sir. OK, uh, so is there any question with regards to the topics that I have covered so far? The overview I'm trying to give. All right, so I don't see any raised hand, so maybe we can advance. OK, yes, Jacob, uh, you have a question. Um, sir, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, are X and Y vector spaces or uh, or something? So, as I, so how about you answer this question? See, in vector spaces, we need to have this notion of uh, uh, you know the addition operation and scalar multiplication operation right yes. so here we haven't defined any such uh, 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 you know operation do you agree right so without these operations being defined one cannot even talk about whether they are vector spaces or not do you agree right yes, for a vector space these operations need to satisfy a bunch of axioms or some properties but we haven't even defined those operations so it doesn't even make sense to ask a question whether it's a vector space or not is this okay uh, yes and another question how to check for continuity um, uh, so how to check if a function is continuous OK, so there are uh, several uh, uh, ways in which one can do right. So first is, uh, uh, you know, uh, there is like an epsilon delta definition OK of uh, 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 continuity, right? And uh, 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 so uh, this is like one definition. Then there is another definition which says that uh, if uh, Xn is a bunch of uh, is a sequence of points that converges to X, 
then we also require that f of x and go to f of x and so on and so forth, right? So if your question was, can we check it uh, algebraically? So the answer is yes. If your question was, uh, uh, can we check it uh, from a computational perspective? Uh, then the answer would be that it's hard to do it that way. Is that okay? Hmm? Okay. All right. All right. OK, so uh, uh, maybe we move on and if there are some additional questions, I'd be happy to take them at the end of the class. OK, so uh, as I mentioned, there are three different notions in which uh, we sort of say that the uh, shape of objects are similar, right? So the first notion was that of homeomorphism. So uh, loosely uh, homeomorphism means that if you do a bunch of operations, whatever is the resultant, uh, the result should be same for uh, homeomorphic spaces. Is that OK? So the next uh, idea is that of homotopy equivalence. OK, so again, there is a formal definition for homotopy equivalence, right? Uh, uh, so that unfortunately due to lack of time I won't be able to uh, uh, discuss that because there is sort of lot of uh, uh, mathematical notions uh, uh, that are involved in that okay but nevertheless let me try to give a, a, a hand wavy uh, definition of when two spaces are said to be homotopy equivalent right so two spaces are said to be homotopy equivalent if one of the spaces can be obtained from the other by either twisting squeezing or stretching but you are not allowed to uh, do the following two operations steering or gluing right so here is a, a slide which uh, basically tells you a bunch of spaces that are homotopy equivalent to each other and a bunch of spaces that are not homotopy equivalent to here uh, to each other okay so maybe i'll first uh, uh, explain the notation over here so you can see that there is a twiddle symbol okay so whenever there is a twiddle symbol okay this means that uh, the two uh, figures or two objects are homotopy equivalent okay so like for example uh, this uh, 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 you know square with a border right so this square with a border okay this is homotopy equivalent uh, to this uh, 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 simple square right the square with a border is equivalent homotopy equivalent to this simple square this square is homotopy equivalent to this triangle right and the triangle is homotopy equivalent to a circle right so these things uh, 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 in some sense should not be surprising okay because if you remember i said that when two objects or spaces are uh, homeomorphic to each other okay so then they are also homotopy equivalent okay so these three things uh, you know uh, uh, the fact that uh, uh, they are homotopy equivalent should not be surprising because it it should not be difficult for uh, you to uh, show that these objects are actually homeomorphic to each other and that automatically implies that they are homotopy equivalent right and in between some of these figures you will see that there is a twiddle symbol with uh, a, a slash across it okay so this is to be read as not homotopy equivalent is this okay so uh, uh, for example here it is mentioned that you have like a hollow disk right so the hollow disk means that this portion over here is uh, not there okay and you have a solid disk right so you have a hollow disk and you have a solid disk and uh, one can see that they are not homotopy equivalent right and the surprising part is that you have a solid disk over here and you have one dot over here and this figure shows that a solid disk and this dot are actually homotopy equivalent to each other okay so let me focus on this part and uh, you would you should be able to analogously uh, uh, you know analyze the other uh, 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 you know relations that have been mentioned on this slide okay so let's look at this uh, these two things over here so you have a solid disk right and the claim is that this is homotopy equivalent to a single dot right uh, uh, and this example is also uh, important from the perspective that these two objects are actually not homeomorphic to each other okay so these two objects so let's call x and y okay so x and y are homotopy equivalent okay so they are homotopy equivalent right but they are not homeomorphic okay so uh, 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 th that's the reason this example is actually special so let's first try to answer why they are not homeomorphic okay so uh, 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 so uh, as i said you have to do a bunch of operations and see if the result turns out to be the same or not so what we will do is we will take one point over here right and try to remove that point let's say i try to either uh, uh, remove a point from the interior right or uh, 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 so we can try and remove some point from the boundary as well but let's say we remove try to remove a point from the interior then what would you end up with right so you would end up 
with a, a solid disc, but the disc which has a puncture over here, wherever you remove the point, we would have a puncture over there. OK, so this is the resultant object that you will end up with. On the other hand, if you sort of remove one point from this uh, object on the right, re uh, recall that there is just one point in that uh, 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 object Y. So if you remove something from that object, then uh, you will be left with nothing. Right. So you can see that on the left, when you did some operation, you are left with uh, uh, something right, uh, 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 maybe a punctured disc, right? On the other hand, if you removed one point from here, you would left, you will be left with nothing. So you can see that when we did the same operation, the result turns out to be different. And uh, uh, this is in some sense a loose way of showing that these two objects are not homeomorphic to each other. OK, but uh, nevertheless, they are homotopy equivalent. So why are they homotopy equivalent? So as I said, two spaces are homotopy equivalent. If you can sort of stretch, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, stretch, squeeze, twist, uh, you know, uh, if you perform these operations and if you manage to obtain one object from the other, then indeed they are homotopy equivalent. OK, so how do we sort of get this object? OK, from the object uh, uh, on the left. OK, so the answer is that you keep shrinking this object. OK, so let's say you take this object and you sort of uh, shrink it a bit. So I hope you agree that you will get a smaller solid disk. If you shrink it further, you will get an even smaller solid disk. And if you keep shrinking, I hope you agree that, uh, you know, uh, uh, it will eventually become one single dot. Is that OK? So you can see that by doing this shrinking operation, uh, you can sort of uh, go from a solid disk to a dot. Right. Uh, uh, so now one can ask, OK, you have a figure over here and a figure over here. Why are they not homotopy equivalent? Well, the reason is that, of course, you can, you know, uh, uh, keep doing this. Right. You can sort of uh, uh, take them closer and closer. Sorry. So you can take them uh, closer and closer. However, in order to get this part over here, I hope you agree that you will need to stick these two things. Right. So uh, recall that uh, you are not allowed to do this sticking as soon as you do this sticking. OK, uh, to go from one space to another, you cannot conclude that those two spaces are homotopy equivalent. OK, and one can show that the only way you can go from this to this is by, uh, 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 you know, in including some gluing operation right in order to get this portion over here. And that is the reason. Uh, these two spaces are not homotopy equivalent, right? So now you have a bunch of examples uh, of spaces which are homotopy equivalent. OK, so here uh, these two spaces are homotopy equivalent. These two spaces are not homeomorphic. And you also have a bunch of uh, examples where two spaces are not homotopy equivalent to itself. So since they are not homotopy equivalent to each other, uh, 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 by that fact itself, one can conclude that these two spaces are not homeomorphic as well, right? <laughs> so I hope that is clear. OK, <clears throat> now uh, comes the last part. Uh, 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 so we have finished the discussion on homeomorphism. We have also finished this discussion on homotopy equivalence. Now we come to the third part, which is equivalence of, uh, 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 you know, uh, from the perspective of homology. Yes, Ayush, go ahead. You have a question. Yes, sir. Can you please move to the previous slide? Yes. How are these squares two square one with the bounded region and one the first uh, are equivalent? These two. Yes, these right? two. Yes. Yeah. So again, uh, as I mentioned uh, in this uh, uh, picture over here, right? Uh, uh, you can keep shrinking this uh, square with a boundary, right? So you can take this thing, you sort of shrink this a bit more, then you will end up with something like this. Then you continue to shrink it even further, right? Uh, so you will end up with something like this, and you keep shrinking it. Is that OK? So the shrinking operation is allowed. And as you can see, if you keep shrinking this boundary, you will end up with this square. OK, so of course, uh, all these definitions are hand baby. Uh, there is a formal definition of when two spaces are homotopy equivalent. OK, so uh, the formal way of uh, checking whether uh, uh, these two spaces are homotopy equivalent or not, OK, uh, uh, is uh, uh, via the formal definition. OK, so I am right now only giving some intuitive justification. I hope that answers your question. OK, yeah. Okay, okay. All right. Okay, so the third is this concept of homology. And as I mentioned, this will form the dominant domi dominant part of discussion uh, in this course. Okay, so uh, 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 so uh, loosely again, we will look at the formal definitions, uh, uh, you know, later on. Okay, because again, it in involves a lot of algebra and so on and so forth. Uh, so, uh, you know, we don't have time in today's class to discuss this. However, this concept of homology is something that we, that we will discuss in complete detail in this course. Okay, but at this point, we will say that two spaces or two objects have the same homology 
if they have the same number of holes in different dimensions okay so in that uh, case we will say that they have uh, uh, their homology groups are isomorphic okay so uh, 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 and in this context okay an important concept that we will be using throughout this course is that of the betty number okay so this is named after this mathematician enrico betty okay so uh, the kth betty number loosely corresponds to the number of holes of dimension k plus 1 okay so let me give uh, some quick example of what do i mean by that okay so here are a bunch of uh, spaces and uh, corresponding to that you can see a bunch of uh, betty numbers listed okay so let's look at this so you have a solid two dimensional blob over here right so uh, this region is actually filled because you have one connected component the betty 0 is 1 okay so betty 0 actually looks at the number of connected components okay so why does it look at the number of connected components and so on and so forth okay uh, once we look at the uh, algebraic definition later on you will be able to see why it looks at the number of connected components so this object has one connected component this has one connected component this also has one connected component this also has one connected component that's why betty 0 is 1 in all the four cases Uh, on the other hand there are no holes over here okay that's the reason all higher order betty numbers are zero okay on the other hand if you look at this uh, two dimensional blob with uh, these holes over here that is there are some punctures that have been made right because each hole is two dimensional in nature okay uh, betty 1 uh, 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 is 3 over here okay so 3 over here corresponds to this hole over here this hole over here and this hole okay and there are no higher dimensional holes that is why the higher order betty numbers are all zero let's look at this third example in this we have a hollow sphere okay so this is a hollow sphere okay you may want to think of a, a, a tennis ball at the back of your mind okay think uh, keep it uh, keep a tennis ball at the back of your mind right so tennis ball recall is uh, hollow from inside right uh, and that hollow region is three dimensional and that's the reason betty 2 over here is one and there are no two dimensional holes over here that is why betty 1 is zero and so on and so forth right and similarly uh, for a torus one can see that uh, uh, it's a connected component that's why betty 0 is one okay uh, so torus uh, is basically like a, 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 a hollow cycle tube Okay, so this is a hollow cycle tube, right? Uh, 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 so because there is this hollow region over here, that region is three-dimensional in nature. That is why Betty two is one. Whereas uh, there are like two holes over here. The first hole is over here, and the second hole is over here. Okay, and that's the reason Betty one is two. Okay, so why these holes are there? Why uh, similar holes are not here, and so on and so forth? Okay, that requires some deeper understanding of these concepts, and eventually you will be able to see why a torus. Uh, has betty 1 equals 2 and so on and so forth but at this point what you need to understand is that okay for these different spaces we are able to quantify its shape in terms of some numbers okay that is the most important part or the, uh, that you should take home from today's class right that there are some numbers which one can use to quantify the shape of these different objects right and these are the numbers that are easy to compute one can write algorithms to compute these numbers and in turn be able to say something about the shape of these different objects is this okay uh, so now let me come back to the original question that i had posed at the beginning of uh, 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 you know uh, this slide okay what is the shape of this data right so let's say uh, i ask you what is the shape of this data now if i ask you this question without you know you knowing uh, 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 you know anything about homology what what would your approach be right your approach would be perhaps to squint your eyes right like uh, for example if i gave you this uh, uh, bunch of points over here and i ask you what is the shape of this object perhaps your answer immediately would be a circle but notice that i have only given you a bunch of points over here right i have only given you a bunch of points and a circle is something like this this is like a solid ring right so whereas there is no solid ring over here nevertheless you can see uh, you will be able to see that this is a circle and the reason you are able to see uh, say that this is a circle is because you are uh, you know in some sense interpolating in between 
right similarly if i tell you what is the shape of this object over here right uh, uh, again uh, 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 you know you would be uh, able to say that this is the alphabet a right alphabet a again is this solid thing but you are able to say this is a because uh, you know uh, mentally you are doing this interpolation right so the question one can ask is okay what is the formal way of doing interpolation well the answer to that is that you draw a circle centered at each of these points is that okay you draw a circle centered at each of these points and then you look at these union of these balls right so uh, uh, of course what is the radii that needs to be chosen okay that is a very very important question so you can see that if you choose a certain radii the union of balls will look like this if you choose a slightly higher radii then the union of balls will look like this and if you choose a even bigger radii then the union of balls will uh, uh, you know look something like this right and you can see that the union of balls uh, for different radii has different shapes right in particular if you sort of look at the union of balls over here this in some sense looks like a circle right so you can see that there is some puncture over here right so again uh, uh, the question of what radii to choose and so on and so forth is very very important and often uh, 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 you know in practice what uh, uh, practitioners do is instead of looking at one radius they actually look at a whole family of uh, radius and try to compute the shape of these different uh, 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 you know the union of balls in the resulting figure for different radii Okay, so uh, maybe I'll pause here. Uh, uh, Professor Vijay, uh, how much more time do I have? Uh, that's okay. I mean, why don't you finish and then I, we can try to finish before 10.55 so that, uh, yeah. Okay, okay. No so maybe I'll take uh, like a couple of minutes more and I should right. be done. Okay. All right. Okay, so this is uh, uh, the main idea over here. If you are given a bunch of points, right somehow you try to take the uh, uh, you know balls centered at these uh, data points look at their union and try to ask what can we say about the shape of these union of balls okay so that's the kind of question that we are interested in answering uh, as part of this entire course is this okay so of course uh, 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 again one can ask what what do i mean by shape of this union of balls well the answer is that you can try to look at their homology groups right and you can look at their betty numbers and count uh, the holes of different dimensions like for example over here okay the betty one would turn out to be one right whereas if you sort of uh, uh, look at the uh, union of balls in this perspective right here uh, you will notice that uh, there are no uh, two dimensional holes right that is enclosed so betty 1 over here will be 0 okay and uh, betty 0 will correspond to the number of components so betty 0 over here will be you know one component is over here one component is over here and so on and so forth so this will be some non trivial number and uh, whereas here betty 0 will be 1 is this okay? So as you can see for different radius, you can compute the shape in terms of these Betty numbers. So the take home message here is that, okay, by somehow looking at these Betty numbers, which are numbers, right, which you can compute, you can somehow quantify the shape. Okay, so that's the most important uh, 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 message that you should take home. All right, okay. So again, one can ask, uh, okay, I have these, uh, uh, you know, union of balls and so on and so forth, uh, uh, you know, computing the shape, I understand, uh, you know, one can uh, uh, sort of write, uh, uh, you know, try to compute the Betty numbers and so on, but still it's not clear, okay, how one can compute these Betty numbers, right? Uh, uh, how do I look at this union of balls? How do I store this union of balls as part of my algorithm and so on and so forth, okay? So that's the question which we will now try to answer. Well, the answer to that is, one possible way in which you can encode the information present in this union of balls is via what is called as a simplicial complex. Okay, so at this point, you can think of a, a simplicial complex as a way to model your given data. Is this okay? Uh, or the given connections or the connections between your given data, right? A simplicial complex is an object that is useful to model this, right? So uh, separately, one can also study, uh, uh, you know, simplicial complex on its own. And one can ask, what is a simplicial complex? Well, a short answer is it's a generalization of a graph, right? So here is an example of a simplicial complex. This entire thing is an example of a simplicial complex. Why is it a generalization of a graph? Well, you can see that in a graph, you have these vertices and edges and so on and so forth. In this uh, uh, figure, you can see that in addition to vertices, you also have edges, you also have triangles, and you also have tetrahedrons, right? So in that sense, a simplicial complex also includes higher order relations, 
right? <coughs> so one can ask, when is a simplicial complex useful? When is a graph useful? Well, a graph is useful when we only need to focus on binary relations, right? Like let's say uh, uh, you look at Facebook and let's say you have your Facebook friends, right? So you can imagine each person who is using Facebook as a vertex and uh, you can ask, uh, 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 you know, what is the graph that represents the connectivity structure of uh, friends in Facebook? So maybe you put an edge between two users if they are, uh, uh, you know, friends on Facebook, right? So in this sense, you will end up with a graph right? Uh, uh, so that will represent the connections on Facebook. However, often uh, we also have higher order relations, right? Like for example, let's say, uh, 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 you know, uh, the nodes represent the different uh, researchers in ISC, right? Uh, the nodes represent the different researchers in ISC and you will sort of put a, 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 a relation between these uh, 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 vertices, okay, if they have written a paper together. So clearly a paper can be written by more than two authors, right? Consequently, a graph is not sufficient to model these relationships, okay? In such situations, a simplicial complex would be very helpful. Like for example, uh, you know, if these two authors have written a paper, then we will have an edge. If these three authors have a, a joint paper, then we'll put a triangle and so on and so forth, right? So uh, a related entity that uh, some of you may have seen before is that of a hypergraph, so uh, which also is useful for modeling higher order relations. So one can ask, what is the relation between a hypergraph and a simplicial complex? Well, the answer is that a simplicial complex is a special case of a hypergraph in that every simplicial complex is a hypergraph, but not every hypergraph is a simplicial complex. A simplicial complex, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, needs to satisfy this additional property that it should be closed under what is called as the subset operation. Okay, so uh, when we sort of formally discuss simplicial complex, I will explain this. But at this point, uh, you can think of a simplicial complex as a special case of a hypergraph. OK, and uh, 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 let me sort of end uh, my part of the discussion. OK, focusing on uh, something called as random simplicial complexes, right? So this will be the last part of uh, 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 my portion or the list of topics that I'll be covering. Right, so a quick question one can ask is why would one want to study random simplicial complexes? OK, so you understand what's a simplicial complex. First of all, you don't know what is a random simplicial complex. And secondly, why should one study random simplicial complex? Well, the answer to that, uh, uh, maybe I'll try and answer it in a different way. Right. So in general, this uh, answer pertains to why study probability, why study statistics and so on and so forth. OK, so the answer is in the following way. Let's say, uh, uh, you know, uh, there are roughly like, uh, 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 you know, 40 odd students in today's class. Right. And if I look at the histogram of uh, the heights of students who are present today. So maybe I'll get something like this, right? So this is the histogram of heights, right? And uh, uh, if you sort of, uh, uh, you know, try to uh, draw a plot that represents this histogram, maybe you'll get this nice bell-shaped curve, right? So immediately you see this curve and you conclude that, oh, this is fantastic. This curve looks really good and so on and so forth. And you may be excited. However, if you are someone who has uh, done a course on probability, you will say that, ah, this is nothing special because the central limit theorem says that under a broad set of conditions, okay, if I look at uh, the histogram of a bunch of data points, it should have this shape itself, right? So you will, you will be able to conclude that this shape is not special, right? However, if your bunch of data points or this histogram that you drew, let's say ended up having a, 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 a tall bar, something like this, because of which the, uh, uh, you know, the bell shaped curve turned out to be something like this. So this is not uh, uh, something that is natural to expect, right? So there is some odd behavior over here, and this may be something that is significant. So the point is that uh, uh, when you, uh, uh, you know, when you sort of analyze your data and you observe some interesting patterns, right? The first question that one would like to ask is whether this pattern is significant or not. Okay, significant meaning, uh, sig uh, uh, meaning, uh, you know, is it different to what one would typically expect, right? <laughs> if it is something that one would typically expect, then one would say that it is not significant. However, if it is something that uh, is uh, not one, what one would typically expect, then one would conclude that it is uh, uh, not significant. Uh, it is significant, right? Like in this histogram, maybe this uh, 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 bar over here is indeed going to be significant, right? So uh, in that sense, why study random simplicial complexes? Well, the answer is that let's say you are given a bunch of data points, you look at the shape of this object and you identify an interesting pattern. 
right now uh, before you sort of uh, you know go ahead and uh, start telling to the world oh i found this interesting pattern i stop found this interesting pattern the first thing that you have to ask is whether the pattern you have found is significant or not okay and in order to answer that question study of random simplicial complexes is very very important is this okay so this sort of uh, brings me to the end of my part of the discussion since uh, i sort of overran time uh, i i'll wait after the class and if you have any questions you can ask me then uh, with regards to whatever i discussed today so uh, professor vijay natrajan uh, uh, i'm sorry for being a bit uh, uh, delay i mean sorry for delaying a bit maybe you can continue from here uh no issues go ahead i mean i just uh, i mean i just wanted to give an intro to tda so i'll just try to do that quickly um okay um hopefully you can see my screen um so um so what i want to do um is uh, to to take you to the uh, to to another aspect of this course Uh, namely how does topology play a role um in data analysis right so this will be the um, running theme throughout the course as you will notice we will often talk about data and uh, talk about topological techniques that help us um, study data um so so i want to talk about two things specifically um i quickly uh, uh, uh talk again about the shape of data uh, because that motivates the study of certain topological structures that help us um, represent this shape um and um, i will end by uh, talking about um, some applications uh, uh, of uh, tda which is topological data analysis um and uh, visualization and i will give you some references to talks and other resources um we already saw uh, how the shape of um uh, uh, data helps us um um understand data maybe reason with data and also compare uh, different data uh, uh so shape is just one way of um uh, uh, so shape shape is one uh, one approach towards um studying properties of data and uh, um trying to understand data there are several other approaches towards um data analysis uh, uh that you may have studied in other courses right so when we talk about shape uh, naturally the one of the early uh, shapes that come to mind is clusters so here you see uh, a collection of points uh, that neatly form uh, three different clusters but does it really form uh, three clusters uh, what if we have some noise in the data right so it's not very clear um, what is the shape of this data set so uh, the question about um, um the, the question what is the shape of this data how many clusters does it have is uh, maybe an easy question to pose but it is a hard question to answer shape can be uh, of other forms um, so we can have um, loops that we have seen or cycles again uh, identifying where are the loops or cycles um becomes difficult when you have noise the loops could be at different scales at different length scales there can be other shapes for example spikes such as this or uh, flares um these are also interesting as we will see in one or two applications later so recognizing these shapes helps us classify data and um uh, once we have this classification of the data into these different shapes we could use that to um uh, to understand different types of data to compare data sets to recognize changes in data to identify outliers and so on um a first step towards uh topological analysis is how do you represent the data naturally uh, the, the simplest representation would be to think of each data point as uh one uh, point in some high dimensional space 
Now, for those of you who have studied topology, maybe in your undergraduate, you know that the simplest form of topology is this notion of discrete topology. So for those of you who don't know, this is essentially saying that every point uh, is in a world of itself, right? And, uh, and, uh, and that determines the so-called topology of this point set. This is a very simple but boring uh, topology. You need a more uh, um, relevant representation of um, this collection of points or your data. And we already saw one way of representing points as a envelope of this union of all these disks centered at the points. Once we have this representation, we can talk about the shape um, using algebraic tools. Uh, so while we saw that, we uh, what there is a second aspect to um, uh, representing a shape, which is shape can come at different sizes, at different levels of resolution. Um, so the the flare or the um, or this branching behavior that we saw earlier um, could be uh, um, could be uh, parameterized uh, depending on whether the green points are noise or not, right? So if there is a parameter that tells me to what extent can I uh, say that the green points are noise? Um, you can either decide that this particular shape is actually a flare or it is just three different clusters, right? So it de depends on whether your parameter um, decides um, when the set of green points are noise or not. So there is an important notion here, na namely that of measuring the shape and using a, um, a parameter, either one or two parameters to decide um, what shape you want to um, um, uh, recognize from the data set. So this is something that we will formalize in the lectures and uh, we will call it uh, persistence. And uh, we will study this on top of the uh, 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 topological invariant that you have seen called homology. So, that, so in that sense, we will study persistence homology. Um, point clouds is one important form of data that we will study. Um, so within this, there is an, there are many different techniques uh, for topological data analysis. One of them is called Mapper. So what Mapper does is take a collection of points in high dimension. So think of the different uh, geometric structures here as a collection of points and reduces it to a graph. The studying this graph becomes easy for comparisons and for understanding. Let's quickly see what Mapper does. Um, Mapper takes an original point cloud. Here the point set is in three dimensions, but uh, but this technique works as it's as is for higher dimensions, and that is where the power of the technique comes from. The fact that it it is applicable to points from higher dimensional space. So we have a point set. Um, we assign a function um, on top of this point set. So here, uh, for a, a simple example, is that the uh, function, uh, which is the x coordinate. So f, the function at every point, is equal to the x coordinate. Um, the range of this function um, is uh, an interval in the real line. So here is just a, a illustration of this function. Um, so, like I said, the range is uh, um, an interval in the real line. We can decompose uh, or we can uh, we use a cover, what is called a cover of this range. So, a collection of intervals that um, represent uh, whose union um, is equal to this range, right? Uh, we use this cover to uh, partition the domain. So um, you may have studied set covers. There is a similar notion of covers for any space. Um, so for example, if you have um, a, an interval in the real line, this can be uh, written as the union of uh, a collection of open intervals. This is called a cover. Um, so each of these open intervals, let's call them A sub i, B sub i, um, can be pulled back into the domain. So there is a collection of points 
from the domain, from the collection of input points, which map to this interval A sub I, B sub I. Um, so these uh, points now, this F inverse of A sub I, B sub I, um, is a collection of points. So this, uh, this uh, F inverse is now called the pullback. So the pullback gives you a cover of the input point set. So what you end up having now is a um, representation of the input point set as a uh, union of different collections of points, possibly with overlap. Um, now we take this uh, pullback cover and represent each uh, cluster here by a node. And uh, two nodes are connected by an edge if they share some data points. So this gives us a graph. This graph is called the mapper. So you can clearly see from this example that the mapper is a good representation of the collection of points and its connectivity. Uh, and mapper has found several applications. Um, for example, uh, uh, all the way from sports data um, where you can identify um, so-called uh, role players uh, who are specialist players um, uh, down to, uh, so if you see the graph on the right, you see uh, that it has many components. Um, this uh, graph can be used to identify different types of players um, in a basketball team. So if you are familiar with basketball, then you know that there are these players called um, guards and um, um, offensive point guards and uh, 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 people who are on the paint, uh, the, the ones who are usually tall and right next to the, to the basket and so on. So this uh, mapper representation of uh, the collection of points um, from your input helps you un un identify the different types of players and maybe use to um, recognize if there is a need for a new type of player in a team. It is used uh, in several other applications. Um, for example, here uh, it was used, um, uh, 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 it was applied on data from Mount Sinai, which is one, one of the leading um, medical research uh, facilities in the US to identify different subtypes of diabetes. And um, this technique was in fact, I uh, was in fact, uh, 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 it contributed towards the identification of a new subtype, um, so which was a, a breakthrough in this uh, study of uh, type 2 diabetes. There are several such applications in the literature. Um, so ISD is a big company that, uh, that works in this space. So here are a few other resources. TTK is a uh, toolkit that implements top topological uh, structures. Uh, there are R packages, there is a package in C, C++, and then there are some homegrown software as well. Feel free to look at this uh, later. There are several talks as well, uh, ranging from the introduction to TDA to uh, um, kind of deep dive into several applications and techniques. Um, the second type of data that I'll talk about in a minute or so is scalar fields. A scalar field assigns real values to points on a domain. And uh, the study of such scalar fields also benefits from uh, topological techniques. Um, so there are two constructs that I will uh, introduce in the lectures. One is called the contour tree, which studies uh, 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 level sets or isosurfaces of this function. And I, an isosurface or a level set is the collection of points that have uh, that uh, are mapped to a given real value. So if you take the function f as the height function, the, the going up, a level set is the set of all points at a given height. So you see these circular contours. These are the level sets. The, the, the contour tree or the Reeb graph captures how these uh, um, contours are connected. So you see the contour tree on the right. Uh, so we will study this topological structure and how it helps us uh, understand scalar functions. Um, we will also study another topological structure called the Morse-Mail complex, 
that studies a scalar field like this. So here is a scalar field uh, uh, visualized as a terrain. Um, and uh, the topological structure uh, that we are talking about, Morsmail complex, takes the critical points and decomposes the space into uh, these so-called watershed regions, regions with uh, uh, similar gradient behavior. Uh, so all the valleys will get uh, is, uh, a region and all the mountains will get a region. And you get a decomposition such as this on the bottom. So you, you have a decomposition into these quads. If you notice each quad here, uh, does not have any criticality. There are no local minima, no local maxima, and no saddles. So it is a monotonic patch. So this decomposition helps study the scalar field uh, effectively uh, by taking away all the geometry and um, what you are left with is just this combinatorial graph structure. So we will study uh, the Morse complex and how it can be used to represent the function at different resolutions by simplification uh, and uh, uh, providing and uh, it how it how it lends itself to a segmentation of the scalar field into these peaks and valleys and so on. Right. So we'll study this in great detail um, in in a few lectures uh, on Morse functions and Morse mail complex. There are several applications, like I said. The contour tree and the merge tree, uh, the, which are related structures that we will study, have been used for identifying symmetry in uh, in virus and in other protein molecules. They have been used in medical applications to highlight different bone structures and so on. They have been uh, also applied to other applications in uh, atmospheric science. On the right, what you see is some applications of Morse complex to material science, to the study of pores and to the study of um, uh, uh, filament structures in the uh, uh, universe. Um, so I will end here. There are a few videos that I've also linked to. Uh, feel free to look at them. These are also available from the VGL IISC um, YouTube channel. Uh, so just search for VGL IISC and uh, uh, feel free to look at uh, many of these um, uh, explanatory videos. Uh, I'll stop there and uh, uh, we can take questions now. So feel free to ask questions and I, in case some of you have to leave for another class, then go ahead. Yes, uh, Sneha. Uh, sir, is this course going to have assignments similar to graphics and visualization? No, uh, the, the, the assignments here uh, and the midterm will be uh, uh, written assignments, pen and paper uh, okay. on um, uh, algorithms and um, uh, writing proofs and so on. Okay, sir. So more similar to maybe what you have seen a little bit in, I'm guessing linear algebra probability and also like uh, the algorithms, the, uh, the design and analysis of algorithms. So none of the assignments and midterm, uh, all the assignments midterm will be pen and paper. The projects can be a combination of both. Uh, that's up to the team. Any other questions? Okay, I think uh, maybe we, we, we will be here for uh, some more time. I think some of you, may, if you have to jump to another class, feel free to do that. Uh, we can, we will stay here for a few more minutes in case you have additional questions. Uh, and, and you can also ask that on, on Teams. So maybe we can close now, Kuhan. Sure. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> so shall we stop the recording? Yeah, so I'll stop the recording.